All right, take your Bible tonight, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 7. We're working our way through this wonderful book in the Bible, a book that I have never studied in detail like we have been doing uh, over the last uh, year. But uh, we're in chapter 7 tonight. We're dealing with part 4 of Better Things for a Better Testimony. The word better shows up about 10 times in the first 10 verses here. And Solomon gives us a contrast of a number of different things that will help us to have a better name, to be a better Christian. In verse 1, we saw the value of character over comfort. A good name is better than precious ointment, he says. Then uh, we looked at, secondly, the value of the completion of your life versus the commencement of your life. He says, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. He says, the day of your death actually is better than the day of your birth. And we, we went into that and talked about that. Then in verse 2, we saw the value of cemeteries and funerals versus cheerful feasts. It's better to go into the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. We talked about the lessons that you learn from those who are mourning compared to the lessons that those who are feasting. Then uh, we uh, came to number four, uh, in verse three and four, the value of cheerlessness versus chuckling. He says, sorrow is better than laughter, for by, thy, for, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. So we went into that, talked about the lessons in that. So now we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to look at verse 5 through 7. The value of the correction of the wise versus the compliments of fools. Look at Ecclesiastes 7, 5. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Now we're going to dig into all that tonight. So let's pray. Bless our time together, Lord. Help us to understand what you're trying to get across to us here. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So another principle that will help you to have a good name and benefit your life is correction from wise men. Correction or rebuke is painful for sure. Have you ever been corrected by anybody? Anybody in that club? Raise your hand. Okay, it's most of us. Uh, correction has a way of stinging sometimes. It wounds. Correction is usually not on our list of things to do today. Be corrected by somebody. We would much rather hear compliments and praise. Maybe a good joke. If you have a godly mother or father. If you have ever worked for anyone. If you have ever been in sports, you, might, you most likely know what it's like to be corrected. I know I've had my share of correction in my life, lifetime. My mom and dad, they didn't put up with anything, especially my father. Uh, correction I have received, however, has helped me to do better, to do what is right, to be more effective at what I'm doing, and to avoid future mistakes. And, you know, as distasteful as correction is, it's more beneficial than the praise, the pleasant words, or the songs of a fool. When constructive correction is done with a loving spirit at the right time with genuine concern for you, it goes a long way in helping you to be a better man, a better woman, a better boy or girl. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 5 and 6, 
Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The airways today are filled with the songs of fools. People actually give awards for such songs that many times pro promote a message of drunkenness, adultery, immorality, getting high on drugs, gambling, cheating, hating America, and cursing God. They give awards to people for songs like that. They're crazy. Such songs are songs of fools. There's nothing glamorous about this kind of behavior at all, even though the world tries to paint that picture. Instead, these things that are sung about, they lead to gloom and groaning hearts. The praise or the songs of fools, they are pathetic, paltry, without power and purpose. They are like the dust in the wind. Solomon compared the pleasing words, the laughter, the flattery, the hollow, joyful mocking of fools as empty and vain like crackling thorns in the fire under a cooking pot. This is actually a play on words in the Hebrew language. The word for thorns is the word seer, okay? And the words for pots is the word seerah. The laughter of a fool is like the crackling of the seer under the seerah. In fact, the pulpit commentary says that a Reverend Wright translates this verse like this. Like the noise, like the noise of the nettles, under the kettles. That's how he translated it. Then there was a Reverend Plumtree. He worded it this way. The crackling of stubble which makes the pot bubble. That's how he translated it. You know, when, we're, when wood was scarce, hay, stubble, and thorns were used to fuel their fires. The thorn plant of Ecclesiastes is the Sarcopaterium spinosum. I know that you came to hear that tonight. Amen? I mean, that was on your agenda today to hear that, that, those two $10 words. Amen? But you know what? That plant was a common plant in the Middle East. This plant is a, a dwarf perennial shrub that resembles, it resembles a ball or a pillow. That's what it looks like. The female flower re resembles a covered pot on this plant. These flower pots are numerous on the stems of this plant. When the female flower is young, it is green, but turns reddish color at maturity. And when it dries out, it turns a rusty brown. Now, in the heat of fire, the flower pots pop and produce a small explosive sound which sounds like crackling. These materials would snap, crackle, and pop like Rice Krispies. Amen. These thorns would not burn very long at all and had little impact. They would blaze quickly, just like that, and then they would rapidly fade out. Now, in the same manner, the praise, the laughter, or gaiety of the fool has little impact and does not last very long. It may be loud like popping thorns, but it is shallow, empty, 
without value and meaning. Job said that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. Job 20 verse 5. Now Solomon mentioned two offenses that demanded correction for sure. He mentions oppression or extortion and then he mentions bribery. There is value in correcting a person who is involved in extortion or oppression toward another person. Extortion tends to threaten people with demands for money. You do better do this for me, you better give this to me, so I'm going to let you have it, you know. That kind of intimidation, that threat. Those who oppress others, they try to control them with cruelty, with intimidation and violence. There's always a school bully who's always wanting to pick on the little kids. And sometimes what they'll do, they'll threaten to beat them up if they don't give them their lunch money or do something else for them. Almost every school has them. I found out in high school, the way you deal with those people is you stare them in the face and say, what do you want to do? You're going to do what to me? I don't think so. And you know what they do? They back off. That's what they do. Have you ever been in a fight preacher? Oh, yeah, we won't talk about that, okay? <clears throat> but you know one thing about it, I just didn't let people bully me. I'd rather go ahead and duke it out than be intimidated or beat up or bullied by anybody. And I didn't like anybody picking on my friends either. Uh, sometimes we have to stand up for other people. How I got on that, I don't know, but I'm going to move on, all right? <clears throat> You're going to get me riled up and, get, and just get me going here, get the adrenaline moving right here. I'm going to tear up this microphone right here. <clears throat> now, notice he, he, he talks about a wise person becoming mad here. That word mad is from a word halal, which means this. Get this. It means to make into a fool. One of the most discouraging things you can witness in life is a wise man turning into a fool. That's discouraging. If a person is an extortionist or an oppressor, he is a fool and should be sternly rebuked and even disciplined. Psalm 62.10 Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Now, if a person is hanging around a crowd or individuals that are oppressive or a bunch of bullies, then that person needs to be corrected and warned not to hang around those kind of folks. Listen, if you're here tonight and you're running around with a bad crowd of kids, you better get away from them because they're trouble. And they'll do what they can to sweep you in their little funnel of trouble. If they're going to get in trouble, they want you to be in trouble too. See, the troublemakers do not like to suffer alone. They want other people to suffer with them, okay? The best thing to do is avoid troublemakers. Paul said, be not deceived. Okay, what? Evil communications. That word communications means companions. Evil companions, evil communications corrupt good manners. You run around the wrong crowd, and I'm talking to big people here tonight as well as teenagers. Uh, you run around the wrong kind of people, it's going to affect your life. And it's going to ruin your testimony. This is good for mom and dad and grandma and grandpa too. I like this. Good preaching, Brother Rod. Amen. <laughs> Running with the wrong crowd can cause you to make choices that will damage your good name. You don't want that to happen. A gift or bribe destroys or corrupts the heart, according to verse 7. In fact, bribery should be rebuked because it places money above justice, truth, purity, or fairness. We have problems in Washington, D.C. tonight because of that reason. A lot of these guys who are in office have been paid off by bad people and they're making bad laws. That's why we have so many problems. These things are sacrificed for the sake of the bride. The money persuades people to make wrong decisions. 
which end up hurting other people as well as the person who accepts the bride or the gift. Taking bribes will definitely damage your reputation. It will damage your name. It'll get out that you can be bought off, okay? In the book of Acts, the Jews hated Governor Felix's guts, as we used to say as a kid. They hated his guts because he took bribes. That's why. Exodus 23, 8. And thou shalt, not, and thou shalt take no gift. Let's talk about bribes there. For the gift, or the bribe, blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. Proverbs 17, 23. A wicked man taketh a gift, or a bribe, out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. Proverbs 15, 27. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts, or hateth bribes, shall live. So that brings us to the next point. Look at Ecclesiastes 7. Look at verse number 8 now. We see the value of completion versus commencement. Verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Solomon provides another important principle in establishing a good name for yourself. He, com he compares commencement with completion and maintains that completion or finishing is much more better for you. There is nothing wrong starting something. You have to start somewhere to finish or complete a task. You got to start. Starting can be fun, but you know what? Starting can be a drudgery too. Starting is fun because it's something that is new or it's fresh for you and, and it can be very exciting. You wonder where your task and your goals are going to take you when you start out. You are also excited about reaching your goal. Starting can also be a drudgery because the goal might be far away and take a while to complete. Took four years to go through Bible college. Now the day I walked into that school, I was excited, and I stayed pretty much excited all the way through it. It got real exciting after I met Linda. Amen. I was excited. I was counting the days until we got married. Uh, I'll tell you what. Now, I don't know how I got on that, but I'm going to move on, all right? <clears throat> you may be dreading the work and the expense of reaching your goal. Of course, I knew to go through college, I was going to have to work my way through and it was hard work. And sometimes it was drudgery, especially when you had to go to work at, uh, at uh, 1030 at night and you didn't get off till 3 in the morning. And then you had to drive another hour to get back to campus. And you had a class at 8 o'clock in the morning and you're saying, where do I find sleep here? You know, uh, it was hard. You know, if you have failed in the past, starting over can ex be extremely difficult. You may lack confidence because you are embarrassed about past failures. Starting is important. It, in fact, it takes character in a person to start, to start somewhere. It takes character to get out of bed and to go to work or to go to school. As important as starting or commencement is, Solomon said that completion is better for you. Finishing what you have started is important. It requires character too. Some folks go through life with too many brands in the fire. They start a, a bunch of different prospect or projects, but they don't complete the projects. Now that's not a good thing to do. I've had to counsel people in my lifetime, and they say, Preacher, I'm just stressed out, and I just say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got so much going on, I don't know even where to begin. I said, that's your problem. And you say, what do you mean? you got too many brands in the fire. There's some things you need to stop doing. Those things that are not important, you just need to say no. And get done what is important. Finishing what you have started 
that takes resolve and it takes discipline to finish what you've started. Completion was a big deal to Jesus Christ. Completion was a big deal to a guy named the Apostle Paul. Both men were determined to complete, to finish God's will for their lives. I hope that's your desire tonight. By the grace of God, I want to finish God's will for my life. And you know what? He's still unfolding things for me to do. And he's doing that, I believe, for you too. Things that he wants me to do, leading me to do. You know, uh, Jesus said in John 4, 34, he said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Well, what was the work? Down the cross for our sins. That's what it was. Acts 20, 24, Paul said, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's my life verse. And it was a heartbeat of the Apostle Paul. One of the most memorable Olympic athletes of the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games was a marathon runner from Tanzania. His name was John Stephen Akwari. He doesn't get mentioned in the record books at all. But that's not the point we want to make here. In fact, it's fair to say that more people remember John Akwari than the guy who won the gold medal of the marathon race that day. Even though John Akwari came in last. He came in last, but he's remembered more than the gold medal winner. Halfway through the race, Akwari fell down, badly cutting his knee up and dislocating the joint in his leg. Ouch, ouch, ouch. He was in terrible pain, <laughs> really. John picked himself up strapped up his leg with white bandages and he kept on running even though he had 13 miles to go. He was only halfway there. A little more than an hour after the winner had finished the marathon there were just a few just a few thousand spectators left in the Olympic Stadium. Now you can understand there's probably 80 to 100,000 people that were in there when it's full. Now there's about 5,000 left. Why? The race was over about an hour ago. Well into the stadium came John Stephen Akwari of Tanzania. His leg was all bloodied and bandaged. You could see the blood on the bandages and stuff. He was hobbling and wincing in pain at every step. But you know what? That guy just kept pressing forward. He wasn't going to give up. He wasn't going to quit. Thousands of people who a few minutes before sat in silence. They began a slow, steady applause as he started making his way, his final way around the track. John made his painful way around that track and that cheering crowd got louder and louder and louder. That trek around the track seemed like it was unending, but finally he hobbled across that finish line and that crowd went nuts. They roared. They went crazy as if he had been the winner of the race. He finished last among the 74 competitors, but by the grace of God, he finished the race. Good for him. Now, why did he not quit since he was injured? 
<laughs> in intense pain and had no chance of winning at all. Well, after the race, Akwari answered this question. He simply said, I don't think you understand. My country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish the race. Now, beloved, God help us as Christians to have the same attitude as that, a that athlete. Beloved, God has called us to do the same thing in our race for Jesus Christ. God wants us to finish what He has started in us. Whether you realize it or not, if Christ is your Savior, you're running a race for Jesus Christ. You're running a race for the Lord. Now, you may run it, you may run it poorly, but you're running a race for Jesus Christ. He's got a plan for you. He's got a pur purpose for you. The thing is, are you doing what He wants you to do? Are you going forward? Or are you sitting down on the bench taking a rest? What are you doing? You know, 2 Timothy 4, 7. Paul said this. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He said that right before he was executed. Before they killed him, he said that. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may obtain. Listen, God has rewards for you as a Christian. Will you obtain those rewards by being faithful? Philippians 3, 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So how do we finish God's will for our lives? Okay, we're running a race. We're to serve the Lord in some way or another. So how do we finish our race? Well, number one, clear your heart and your mind of conflicts. Many believers today, they do not finish what God has called them to do because they get entangled in conflicts with other people. This is especially damaging when they get into disputes with other Christians. The conflicts may be with a spouse, with parents, children, friends, neighbors, church members, even a pastor. Some continue to fight, remaining miserable, while others, they get out of church, some get out of the house, some get out of the marriage. What is so sad is the fact that they fuss about things which in many cases are really stupid and very petty or could be easily resolved if they would just sit down and talk about the problem or the misunderstanding. The bitterness that brews from such battles quenches the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life. It quiets the tongue in praising Jesus Christ and witnessing to others. It quashes any past decision to be surrendered to the Lord. It quickens the temper and it quivers the stability of the Christian's testimony and faithfulness. Beloved, if somebody has wronged you, and they will, somebody sooner or later is going to do that. If somebody has wronged you, just go ahead and forgive them and get it out of the way. Don't allow petty conflicts to rob you of your fire, your zeal, your love, your joy and compassion for the souls of men and doing the will of God in your life. Stay on track and finish your race for Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on the finish and don't get distract, distracted by stuff that brews up in your life because it's so easy to get distracted. Now there's a second thing you can do. Correct any wrongs toward other people. One of the key reasons why people do not focus on the finish is their unwillingness to correct any wrongs in their own lives. They will not seek forgiveness when they need to do this. They won't go to people and seek forgiveness and apologize 
and make things right. They just won't do it. Too proud. They will not make things right, right with other people that they have hurt. They will not repent of sins that have hurt their testimonies. They are unwilling to do this because of rationalizing or excusing what they have done. You know, they reason this way. They said, well, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, they have forgotten about what I did. They are at fault as much as I am. Because they are unwilling to correct their offenses or their mistakes, their offenses remain obstacles in ministering or helping other people. People remain focused on their faults instead of what they are trying to do now. Beloved, if you have wronged someone or if you have hurt the cause of Jesus Christ by your actions, then first of all, get the matter right with the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> if you need to get things right with other believers, get those things right with other believers. If you need to get things right with unsaved people by by the grace of God, get that done quickly. Because those people are dying on their way to hell. And you might be the obstacle on their path to finding Christ as their Savior. They may not get saved because of what you have done. Boy, God help us if that ever happens. No matter how long ago it's happened, get it right. Matthew 5, 23, the Bible says this. Therefore, if thy bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, Leave there the gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer the gift. Acts 24, 16, Paul said, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Paul wanted to make sure things were right with God and right with people in his life. Now, if you've tried... Uh, you, if you go to some people, they don't want to get things right. They're just still ticked off at you. They're bitter. Some people are so bitter that you just can't make any headway. And preacher, I did try. I was trying to get things right. Well, just keep praying for them and try again later. Okay? <clears throat> well, preacher, I did talk to them. And I asked them to forgive me, but they won't forgive me. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to make right what you have done wrong, to ask forgiveness for what you have done wrong, and if they don't want to get things right, if they don't want to clear things up, <clears throat> turn them over to the Lord. God has a way of dealing with people like that. The key thing is you deal with you. Yeah, but they did this and this and this. All right, now, now come on now. Are you going to forgive them or not? But they did this and this. No, no, no. What did you do? You deal with what you did. You deal with your hand, okay? Yeah, but they did all this, all right? Leave that hand to God and let him deal with it. That's what you've got to do. You can't change their heart anyway. But I've tried. Just do what you're responsible for. And if you do that, your conscience is clear. You've done what you're supposed to do. And you can go forward in your Christian life. Just continue to pray for them. Continue to love them. Don't get bitter at them. Don't get angry. Don't let that happen. You just make sure that your heart is clean and pure with God and you've done your best to get things right with other people. Well, we're going to stop right there.